my name is Robert and I'm a lecturer at Imperial College London and my journey here started 10 years ago. So I, uh, I grew up in, in New Zealand in Auckland and I did my undergraduate degree there. And then at the end of that, uh, so in 2012, I got a scholarship to do my PhD in Cambridge. Um, and that was working on oxides for uh, photovoltaics. And after that, I uh, got a postdoc position at MIT, uh, where I began working on developing new generation of non-toxic materials. For, you know, after, after that, I returned to Cambridge. I got um, something called a junior research fellowship, which allowed me to become an independent researcher and start putting up my own research group. And that was that was based in Cambridge. Um, and then, yeah, very, very recently, actually not, not too recently, in, in 2020, I moved to Imperial to, to take up a lectureship position, which is a permanent academic post. And what my research focuses on is developing a new generation of semiconductors that can tolerate imperfections, because all materials are not perfect. Uh, they all have you know, defects present within them. And the question is how you manage these defect states. Um, historically, the way these have been managed is to get rid of the defects as much as possible. And that usually requires quite expensive manufacturing routes, which has quite big implications when it comes to um, you know, energy applications. For example, if you look at photovoltaics, or if you look at um, you know, light emitting diodes, they're all based off you know, quite expensive fabrication processes requiring high temperatures, because you want to get rid of these defects as much as possible. So what my research has discovered is a new way to manage these defects, which is um, by changing the energy levels at which they're at, so that you can have these defects present, but they're not harmful to the performance. So you can still get efficient performance despite having many defects present. And this is something that we call defect tolerant semiconductor. And the implications are that you can make these materials now at low temperatures, so emit less CO2 when you fabricate these devices, um, uh, but still get efficient performance. And you can uh, you know, achieve efficient performance using uh, much lower cost fabrication methods. So we're using this to uh, develop an, you know, the next generation of energy, uh, um, you know, clean energy uh, devices, so including photovoltaics, so materials that can you can put on top of uh, the standard silicon uh, photovoltaic devices to enhance the efficiency or uh, for harvesting indoor light. And this is the focus of my uh, European Research Council uh, starting grant project, which is to make uh, indoor photovoltaic devices. And the reason why you want to do that is to uh, more sustainably power the Internet of Things. So the Internet of Things is something that people may or may not have heard of, but it's something that everyone uses already because nearly everyone is going to use contactless uh, pay card payments. So, you know, you would, when you go to a shop, you hold your credit card next to the card reader, and then it does the payment for you. And the way that works is because your credit card has something called a radio frequency identification tag within it. So that is a, one of many different types of Internet of Things devices. And the whole idea behind the Internet of Things is that you have lots of these uh, wireless sensors, uh, connected to some sort of devices that can perform a certain function. And an example that uh, you, we may think of, it could be uh, for, for you know, tall buildings, so skyscrapers. And you know, let's say we have thousands of these wireless sensors with uh, temperature and uh, humidity sensors all across the building, which can detect how many people are present and what the temperature is uh, in the room at a particular time of the day. And you know, by uh, detecting this information, it can transmit this information to a central server, um, which then can adapt how the building is heated. So that instead of just having a fixed heating regime for the building, uh, you have a heating regime that adapts depending on what the requirements are. So you have, in other words, you have a more intelligent building because it has these sensors which can detect and respond, uh, have, have a you know, heating system that can respond based off what the heating needs are for the particular building. So that's just one example of how you know, the Internet of Things can make a big impact on reducing the CO2 footprint of our society, as well as reducing you know, heating bills. And you can apply this concept towards many other different sectors. You can apply it to healthcare, to manufacturing. And it's all based off having many of these wireless sensors. 
Now, if you think about, go back to the example of the credit card, you know, you have to hold it really close to the card reader. And the reason for that is because it doesn't have much power. You have to, uh, you, and you know, you have to um, have a very short distance between the transmitter and the, uh, uh, and the tag. So to increase the trans communication distance, which is really what you want to uh, support your, your smart e ecosystem, you want to ha have each of these autonomous devices um, with autonomous power supply. So for example, you can connect them up to a battery, so have lots of these tags all with their own batteries, and then they have enough power to communicate over a larger distance, uh, so they don't have to be placed so close to uh, the, the, the transceiver. Um, but, which is fine, but if you think about your smoke alarm, for example, your smoke alarm at home, that's also powered off a battery, and after two years you have to replace it. And which is not a problem because it's just one smoke alarm. But let's say now you have each person, each person in the world has a hundred of these autonomous devices each. And the fact is no one's going to replace that many batteries so frequently. So, um, and that, that's, a, that's a practicality challenge associates that which is going to limit how many of these autonomous devices you have and therefore could limit the potential of the internal things. Another limitation would be if you think about how many batteries you have to replace uh, on, on a frequent basis. And you know, if, if we have a trillion auto, uh, Internet of Things devices, which is what many people predict is, is feasible in the next few years, if we have a trillion of these devices, then we will have to replace over 100 billion batteries every year. And if you think about the waste that will create, the uh, drain upon the Earth's resources, it's going to be a significant sustainability challenge. So going back to my project, so for my, for my um, European Research Council starting grant project, what the aim is, is to develop these photovoltaics that I've been creating and to use them to harvest the energy that's already available from indoor lighting. Because inside the home, inside the office, or inside the factory, we, everyone has uh, lighting indoors, which is used for seeing uh, inside buildings, but it also has a lot of energy that we're not making use of right now. So the idea is to use these photovoltaics to harvest the energy that's freely available from indoor lighting so that we can power power these autonomous Internet of Things devices and also to recharge the batteries that they have so that when the lights are switched on, you use these photovoltaics to power the devices and recharge the batteries so that the batteries have enough power to power the devices when the lights are switched off. And together, by using a photovoltaic plus a battery, you can create a power supply unit that you never have to replace so that overcomes both the practicality and the sustainability challenges that we currently are facing with the Internet of Things. Yeah, sure. So, so the ELC starting grant is probably the biggest grant that any early career researcher can get. Um, certainly in the UK, it's the biggest um, monetary value. So it's worth one and a half billion, uh, million euro, euros. Um, so it's so the biggest grant that we can get. And it's you know, highly desired by all early career researchers. Um, so th there's a lot of competition for these. Uh, it's perceived as Europe's um, you know, frontier research grant. Um, and, you know, um, so, so, I mean, at, at Imperial, there's a lot of support for us. So there's uh, a European a Union team based at Imperial, which um, it provides us with information about the requirements for applying for this grant. It also helps us to read through our proposals um, to give us feedback, help us to strengthen the proposal. And I found that to be extremely useful. Um, so, you know, both from the EU team as well as from my colleagues, my academic colleagues, and the, I mean, I'm fortunate at Imperial to be among people, uh, among many researchers who have been successful getting these ERC grants. And, you know, that's something that's not, not so common because, you know, and, um, you know, the success rate for the ERC grant is quite, quite, quite low. Um, so, you know, many other places you may find only one or two people who have gotten the ERC grants. And Imperial, we're fortunate that we have quite a decent community of people who have gone through this process and have been successful and getting feedback from them was extremely useful for me. Um, so for me, you know, the, the journey took six months. Uh, it took me three months to write the proposal and it took me three months to prepare for the interview. You know, the interview, you know, the proposal itself is, uh, has two parts to it, two main parts to it. There's a, uh, the main part is a 14 page uh, proposal, which is the main proposal with all the details. 
And then you also have to write a five-page summary uh, because there's a two-stage selection process in the ESC starting grants. So the first step is, you know, the panel just reads a five-page summary and they shortlist based on that to, they shortlist um, about three times the number of people that they can fund to then go through the full peer review process where the, you know, the full proposal, the 14-page proposal gets read by experts. And in my case, I had nine reviewers. So you can see this is a really uh, rigorous and long process and it requires a lot of thought, a lot of time to be put into uh, writing these uh, grant proposals. And also, I mean, the final step was the uh, was interview where we got a chance to defend our proposal against uh, some of the criticisms from the reviewers and to clarify any uh, misconceptions. And, you know, the interview is, was extremely challenging because it was so short. Uh, we had five minutes to um, make our pitch, you know, for one and a half million euros. And then we had 20 minutes to answer as many questions as we could. So it's a very short interview, very fast. And we had questions from you know, lots of different aspects. Uh, so it took me a lot of time to prepare for that interview. Um, so yeah, it's a very long process and uh, I'm very glad, I'm very grateful that I got it. Um, also, I'm very sympathetic towards you know, the 90% of applicants who weren't able to get it in this round. And I think what I learned from my journey is the importance of being tenacious. And uh, if you believe in an idea to really just uh, keep, keep going at it and uh, you know, success will pay off if you're, uh, if, if you're persistent. Absolutely. So, so the apart from the monetary benefits, um, you know, some of the greatest benefit is the is the prestige of the ERC starting grant. So, you know, across you know, e, the EU, the ERC starting grant is re, well, the ERC grants are, re, are regarded as being the frontier, uh, the, the most prestigious prestigious grant that you can get in Europe. I mean, if, in, in other countries in, in Europe, for example, in Germany, you can get grants that give you more money than that, um, but what I found is that everyone benchmarks their grant against the ERC grant because uh, it's something that anyone in the EU uh, who wants to work in the EU or associated countries can apply for. So a lot of people know about it and a lot of people regard it as you know, being a prize that they really want to get. So it's really highly coveted. Um, so in terms of people who have gotten it, it really helps their career, really helps to build up um, you know, their, 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 um, you know, their prestige across the world especially since the ERC is something that everyone all over the world knows about. I think, I think the prestige also helps to, um, helps, um, you know, young researchers, young research groups to attract, you know, talent from across the world because, you know, you know when, when potential postdoc or student applicants apply to a particular group, they know that they're not just applying to any group, they're applying to a group that was successful being funded by the ERC. So I think that also helps. To get one of these grants, you have to be working within uh, one of the universities, host universities that is either part of the EU uh, or is an associate country. So the UK is an associate country. So, um, so, so that that's the first thing you have to find. You have to. So I think for you know Aust Australasian uh, researchers, you have to have you know, um, you know want want to you know, set up your own group within one of these countries and move from Australia or New Zealand. Um, and that's something that some people may not want to do because, you know, your, your, your career is bigger than one particular grant. Um, on the other hand, maybe people want to have a change and want to use this as a, as a means to, uh, uh, you know, you know, work in the UK or work in one of the European countries. Um, so, so I, I think, I think, you know, the first thing would be to, for people to decide whether this is within their career interests and. Sometimes that, that for them it will be a very clear yes because they've already worked within one of these nations. They already worked within France, or they already are working in the UK. And you know, getting an ERC study grant is the important next step for them um, to establish their own independent careers. Because you know, um, you know, different people get the ERC at different career stages. So the ERC study grant is available for people between two and seven years uh, post PhD. Uh, so at that point in time, some people may be doing a research fellowship or maybe doing a postdoc and then getting an ERC will be extremely valuable in helping them to get a permanent academic position, you know, getting a lectureship somewhere or getting a professorship uh, somewhere. On the other hand, some other people will already have a lectureship and in which case getting the ERC 
would be uh, needed for them to build up their own team, uh, bring in board, bring on board people and essential equipment. We also had you know, received the prestige that they need to um, you know, broadcast their, their work uh, across the world. Um, what, what I would suggest is to get um, as much help as you can. Um, you know, a lot of successful people, you know, who, who have been successful in getting an ELC, uh, one of the ELC grants, they don't do it in isolation. They, you know, have an idea which they really would like to push forward and, and which they really believe in. But then they, they, you know, they, they you know, write the first draft of that proposal and then they get feedback from a lot of people. So I, I think it's really important to have a community of people around you. So um, in that sense, it's a lot better to be within um, a community that already has that well established. For example, Imperial is one example where you know, we have a you know, European office that can provide us and, and read through a proposal in detail and give us you know, technical feedback. We can uh, find a lot of colleagues within our research field who um, you know, probably apply to the same panel as us and who can tell us how the panel would regard the idea and ways that it's framed. So having that community of people is extremely important. And it may be a challenge um, if for a researcher based in Australia or New Zealand where maybe this community doesn't exist. So I think probably if, if someone you know, in Sydney or in Auckland is thinking about applying for the ELC study grant, probably maybe the first step would be to think of you know, which would be the host institution and um, can they find and build up links within a host institution that can provide them with the support that will really benefit them and help them to write a really strong ELC study grant proposal.